turn. High five. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Wow, what a warm welcome. It's <laughs> My first visit to the US was about 18 years ago as a medical student, and I still remember dancing away on the 4th of July, wondering, what exactly are we celebrating our independence from? <laughs> Turns out it's me. Going bald was really depressing <laughs> until I chose to change my mental frame and see it differently. I've saved a fortune on hair care. <laughs> yeah, I've been using the same bottle of shampoo for the last three years. <laughs> Got it in a hotel. <laughs> and I never need conditioner. I dream of split ends, the very thought of one hair becoming two. I can see that you are a talented, hard-working group. Now, while I say that to every audience, today I really mean it. <laughs> you guys have increased your productivity in the last 12 months. Despite all these obstacles, you met your commitments with the And it goes from strength to strength. But here's the catch. If you want to be extraordinarily successful, talent and hard work aren't enough. Talent is commonplace. We're all pretty good at what we do, otherwise we'd be doing something else. And hard work is just the ticket that puts us in the game. We all know talented, hard-working people who, by their own admission, haven't fulfilled anywhere near their true potential. The key to unlocking that potential, I call perspective power. It's the ability to look at a situation from multiple angles so you can sharpen your thinking, dilute toxic emotions, and take action in accordance with your highest priorities. Unfortunately, this conflicts with a psychological pressure called closure, which is so important that in order to demonstrate closure, I'm going to swallow this razor-sharp doggy balloon. Is that something you'd like to see? Yeah. Oh, you people are very strange. <laughs> now, I'm going to need some encouragement for this. Incidentally, this is more dangerous than you realise. I'm allergic to latex. <laughs> I need some encouragement. I, everyone on this side of the room, I need you to clap your hands. I'll, I'll tell you when. I'll tell you when. A, li a little premature, sir. <laughs> everyone on this side of the room, I need you to stamp your feet. I'll tell you when. Questions. The look on your faces has made this whole trip worthwhile. <laughs> Give me 20 minutes, I'll make you the most amazing balloon doggy you've ever seen. <laughs> uh. We experience a drive for closure whenever. Settle down. We experience a drive for closure whenever we face an unresolved situation that leaves us feeling in limbo. It can be anything, you know, waiting for a client to return a phone call, waiting for a scientific assay to complete, or even waiting for a doggy balloon to reappear. <laughs> we don't like unresolved situations. We like to complete the picture, finish the story, achieve resolution. Not knowing drives us nuts. So for the rest of this speech, Whenever you catch yourself wondering, what the heck happened to that balloon? <laughs> That's your drive for closure. If you can't resist your drive for closure, you lose. Here's why. 
Does anyone have a $100 bill I can borrow? <laughs> I know in a room of 800 people that someone has a $100 bill. Who has a, oh, yeah, it would be somebody right at the back. Wonderful, sir. What's your name? name's Rob Elfrick. Rob Hel Elfrick? <laughs> would this be a bad choice? <laughs> I think this could be a great choice. Rob, uh, what's the smallest denomination bill you have? You have a one in a hundred. Audience, we have a choice. <laughs> Rob's going to think we set this up in advance. <laughs> By a round of applause, how many people think I should do this trick with Rob's one dollar bill? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to enjoy the next bit, Rob. <laughs> By a round of applause, how many people think we should do this trick with Rob's one hundred dollar bill? <laughs> Rob, I need you to take this pen and write your initials, big and bold, across the bill. Now, I'm sure you're all familiar with origami. It's an old Japanese word meaning <laughs> to borrow 100 bucks. <laughs> I'm folding Rob's money. That's so I can wrap it in magic toilet paper. <laughs> No, no, I knew it was magic paper when it appeared from nowhere, stuck to the heel of my shoe. <laughs> See, I'm, I'm doing this so that I can't get at it. You see, can't even reach. Some of these jokes I do just for me. <laughs> Don't worry, Rob, this is the funny bit. <laughs> Yeah, this is where we find out if Rob has a sense of humour. <laughs> now, Rob, before I do this, would you like to swap the money for the pen? You would? Fine. Keep the pen. <laughs> oh, <laughs> you haven't got a lighter I can borrow as well. You? Oh, you're in luck. We're okay. We don't like unresolved situations. Especially Rob. <laughs> and so, in order to achieve closure, we make stuff up. Unfortunately, the stuff we make up tends to be negative. Think back to the last time you had an unexpectedly long wait before someone returned a phone call. Or a $50 bill. <laughs> in which direction did your interpretation of that delay naturally tend to go? Positive or negative? Yeah, for most people it's negative. We are masters at taking a speck of information and creating a whole pessimistic scenario. You see, right now, Rob is thinking, is my 20 bucks ever coming back? <laughs> <laughs> you people are no use to me at all. So we achieve closure by making stuff up. And the stuff we make up tends to be negative. Unfortunately, this leaves us fretful and prone to acting impulsively. This leaves us powerless to change our outlook and improve our results. Here's a better strategy. Whenever you feel an overwhelming urge to react in haste, step back and make that reaction a pause. Only then will you give yourself the thinking space you need to get a fresh perspective. Point number three. Ask simple questions and value simple answers. Thomas Kuhn, the guy who coined the phrase paradigm shift, noted that new paradigms tend to be defined either by younger people or those who are new to an industry. In other words, the people still asking the simple questions and value simple answers. A lady once asked me, Dr. Bedwell, how can I stop my five-year-old son, Tom, peeing on the floor when he uses the loo? Are you, is everyone familiar with loo? Yeah, because we have different words for the same thing. You know, we say loo, you say restroom. We say lift, you say elevator. We say accident, you say malpractice. <laughs> <laughs> the advice I gave this lady was to float a ping pong ball in the toilet and challenge her son to use it for target practice. <laughs> and it worked! Tom's mum reported that his toilet habits improved beyond all recognition. And so did his dad's. <laughs> oh. 
I often wonder, what happens when Tom sees people playing ping pong? <laughs> How do you feel, Marsha, about slightly older, ugly blokes? <laughs> yeah, you're in luck! <laughs> <laughs> that would be more funny if this guy didn't look ever so slightly like me. <laughs> hey, Mike. Let's moon the audience. <laughs> Yeah, don't go falling off the stage though. Cameraman, this is your moment. <laughs> Five rounds of applause. How many of you have ever had the experience of remembering somebody's face but not their name? Yeah, me too. You see, we remember things we can visualise so much more easily than something abstract like a name. And in the same way, the only way I can memorise the playing cards is to convert, is to get a fresh perspective and convert each one into a picture. For example, when I see the ace of hearts, I think hat. H for hearts and T is the phonetic sound for one. I know that Marsha's holding the ace of hearts because when I saw it in her packet, I visualised her wearing a huge Dr. Zeus style stovepipe hat. <laughs> You were wearing other things too, Marsha. <laughs> Here we go with the spades. Ace of spades, two of spades, three of spades, four of spades, five of spades, six of spades, seven of spades, eight of spades, nine of spades, ten of spades, jack of spades, queen of spades, and king of spades! Yeah! Yeah!